piacere, no? Well, Shane, obviously, a uh, big pay-per-view only a few days away in a part of the world that's been starved for a big event like this. So what are the emotions now that the hard part of camp's out of the way, now you just got to make weight and go fight someone? Uh, yeah, I feel real excited. I've, I haven't felt this excited for a fight in a, in a good long while. Like, feels like I'm a teenager again, just like real hungry and waking up with a fire in my belly. Um, and just this fight week has been amazing. And to know that I'm going to be fighting basically in front of a home crowd, in Perth, there's a lot of Maori and Polynesians here in Perth, and I think that, like you said, um, how this region's been starving. It's reflected in how how fast the tickets sold out. Like I had people that were in the cart trying to pick it, where they're going to put their seat, and then um, they went to go buy it, and it was gone. So sold out in minutes. So how many of, of your friends and family are actually going to be able to come watch you live? Uh, so I've got two. I got my younger brother and my best friend Gina G who's also an MMA fighter. Um, we call her five under six because she got five babies that were under the age of six. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so they'll be supporting me. Um, they're arriving tomorrow. And I do have some family that are going to be up in the stands as well. It's obviously been a while since we saw you here uh, at, at a media day. I think your last fight was UFC 260, and that was the last pay-per-view in the Apex. And since then, they've gone back on their own. So what was the, the reason for the long layoff? Was it just injuries? Was it to you know sharpen your tools? Was it, was it your choice for this long layoff? Yeah, it was a bit of like the last two, to sharpen my tools and the choice to want to take this time off because I was sick of fighting in front of the, like the Apex yeah. or the, the empty arenas. Like, I um, I love the energy of the crowd and I like to perform for the crowd. So it just, I mean, I've, this is my 15th year of fighting and I didn't work this hard for this long to fight in front of like 40 people. Like it's not just about the money for me. It's the whole experience, the whole like individual life experience that this crazy sport brings. So it's been a good layoff and um, I'm happy that I'm able to do it here in Perth, which is basically like, like a, second home for New Zealanders, yeah. And what do you make of your opponent, Blake, a debuting fighter, uh, a lot of submission wins on his record for however many fights he's had. So what do you make of his skill set that he brings into the octagon? Um, I mean, you know, we'll find out, like, <clears throat> on Sunday when I'm standing across the cage from him, but I know that he's, like, older than me, but he's had, like, a third of the amount of fights in me. Um, so I think I know that experience is going to lend its uh, lend a hand to me. And I don't think he's fought in front of a crowd this big and in hostile territory. So he's going to be under a lot of pressure. Um, I always put myself under a lot of pressure, more pressure than any any fighter could ever put on me. So I'm just looking to perform well. Like I respect him as a martial artist and as an athlete, but I just know the hard work that I've put in and I want to show it on Sunday. Uh, what's it like seeing all those billboards with your face all over the cities? Yeah, that was pretty awesome. That's my good friend um, <clears throat> Kent from Lumo Digital. So he's just a, a good supporter of combat sports in New Zealand. He also got um, King in the Ring, which is the um, premier kickboxing event in New Zealand. He got them on um, the billboards as well. So it's just awesome to be able to have a platform uh, to promote something like that, to use the the networks that we've created through like everything that we've done and, and um, also to help my sponsors like to promote them more so in the future. So you knew those billboards were coming. He didn't just put them up and not tell you? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I did I did all the groundwork. Like I went and got the photos done um, with, from a good friend, Pat McPhee. And then I got a digital designer to make it up and we made all these drafts back and forth. Um, but other than that, he made it easy. I just sent him the files. He gave me a few different sizes and then now they're all over the country. Uh, and the final one for me, uh, how do you see the main event playing out between Alex and Islam? Yeah, I think I think it's going to be what we've not seen from Islam other than the time we got knocked out, which was like pretty flash KO. It's like we've not seen that look of desperation or, or like when you've – I've seen it heaps in my fights. When you break a man, you can see it in their eyes. And I think we're going to see that from Islam. No disrespect to Islam. I just mean that I know the kind of pressure – not just physical pressure that Volk puts on, but he can nullify your offense and then he keeps bringing his offense on. And I think we're going to see that in the fourth round that we're going to see Volk basically break him down, stop all the takedowns, get up from any takedowns, and then um, just keep pouring on the offense. And I think, yeah, it's going to be a hard night for Islam. But 
respect to both fighters, but yeah, I think a fourth round finish from Volk. Uh, Shane, you were one of the last people who actually fought what Volk at lightweight. And I just wonder, like, what does 155 Volk feel like actually in there? Uh, well, so we fought at, it was a catchweight bout because I took the the fight on eight days notice. So it was at 150. And um, so he was 150 pounds. Um I mean, that was 2017, November 2017 as well. And he is by far the strongest person that I've ever fought. And um, I think uh, it might have been Dan Hardy who said, but he said he's like a Lego brick. He just clicks into you and he just presses you against the cage. And it felt like that. It was like the squeeze was like a welterweight or a middleweight being pushed up against the cage. So much so that like my back looked like I was sunburnt, like after the first round. Um, but from then to now, Volk's gotten way stronger. His punches are way stronger. He looks so fast from what I've seen in the in the build up to this fight. He's not lost any of his speed, and we know that his gas tank is like top tier in this whole whole um, sport, let alone his division. Well, dude, you look stronger as well. I know you've been working with Steve Pipe for about a year now, and the photos show the results. You're looking in great shape going in here, but just talk to us about how you're feeling physically and what kind of difference that's made compared to the Shane Young we would have seen a couple of years ago. Yeah, so shout out to my bro, Steve Pipe. He's um, he's a former fighter as well. So he fought all through China and um, Thailand, and he actually worked with um, some of the top tier Muay Thai fighters like Superbon Bunchamek. So he knows what it takes, what, what fighters need in terms of like athleticism to like to be strong and not just strong with weightlifting, but in terms of durability and conditioning. So that's really transferred super like so well into this fight camp because this fight camp has been, you, you can ask Tyson, you can ask um, Janae Harding, who's a fighter for another division, that this has been the hardest fight camp that most of us have ever had. And I, I know it's probably at two to three times harder than any fight camp I've had before. But my, like in terms of the frequency and the how hard we're training, like five times a day, but five hard sessions. But my spirits have been so high. And I think that's like the, the things I'm doing outside the gym, but coupled with the fact that my body is so much more durable from the training with Steve. Yeah. Just quickly as well, New Zealand, when do you think we might be able to see a card back there? Do you have any hopes that it happens soon so you could fight it in front of your home country, in front of your people there? Yeah, I know there's a big end of year card here in Australia at the end of the year. So I'm hoping to get two more out this year in this region, like Singapore or Oceania region, and then to try and get pushing so that next year in 2024 that we can get a, a big card in Auckland City. Yeah, that's my hopes. But I mean, if we do it 2023, that'd be amazing. And uh, Shane, just wanted to ask, uh, is there any specific reason as to why the camp's been so hard? Like why you guys have picked it up a notch? Um, there's not just one specific reason, but one thing that I thought of like an X factor is that, <clears throat> you know, we've all been, I've been in the UFC since 2017 and then, and Dan much earlier than that, but Kai... Bloods, Carlos, Israel, they've all come into the UFC. We've only been in the U uh, like six years. But in that six years, all the guys that are not in the UFC have just been getting better and better and better. So the mat level of our gym has just risen so high to the point where these guys are as athletic as UFC fighters. They are conditioned as UFC fighters and they've got the skills of UFC fighters. So we have these light sessions we're just light grappling, let's say, but it's like you're just training with 30 other UFC fighters. Like, you know, there's only six on the mat, but really the level, the talent pool that we draw from now in, in New Zealand is just, it's massive. When you speak about training with other UFC fighters, Volkanovski spent some time at City Kickboxing. You've fought him before. Have you guys interacted while at the gym and is it awkward? Nah, not at all, bro. I mean, even right after that, we, we'd interacted a little bit before the fight. And um, I think that's why he gave me the nod because I remember when it happened, he had two or three guys pull out and then he just like was like, oh, I mean, I don't want to fight him because he's like a mate, but like, you know, it's a bit of an opportunity if we can make it happen. But we've been on good terms before we ever fought and only better terms since then. And yeah, he's just a stand-up dude. And uh, in the next face-off, uh, will we see another haka? And if someone extends their hand to shake your hand during the haka, what will happen now? Um, I've been in this two years, I've been taking time off to 
get more re- reintegrated with my um <clears throat> that's definitely not the right word but <laughs> um, <laughs> just touching up on my multi culture and um now i'm going to let the time for any performance of that kind happen directly after the win so hopefully there's a lot of maori out there in perth that know the haka tika tonu um it's a great haka but yeah before the fight now it's not not really time to like speak or put anything out there but i will have something prepared awesome thank you Kia shame. Uh, Kia ora, kia koe. Uh, tino pai ahau, brother. Pai ana. Um, coming off a bit of a two-year break, you can train in that time, but something that I imagine you don't really do for fun is cut weight. So how are you feeling getting ready for um, the fight and having to cut weight again? And Do you have to go through some of the intense stuff you see, or is it normally just a bit of a diet? Uh, it's just been a good diet. Like I work with Geordie from the Fight Dietitian. He's been monitoring everything throughout camp. And I've put on a lot more lean muscle, which is actually really good for cutting weight because you hold the water. I'm pretending to sound scientific. I don't actually know. But um, yeah, apparently more lean muscle means that you can draw from that water uh, from the muscle. So now this fight camp, uh, so this fight week has been really good, eating well, staying plenty hydrated and uh, nothing different to last time. Was your fight camp affected much by the floods that happened in Auckland? Well, our gym is very re- resilient. Um, so the day, it was it happened on a Friday night. I trained like 30 minutes before the flood started happening and I drove home and then it just started pouring down. I got a video from Eugene and the gym was flooded out. Like It was for like an hour and a half. It was just pouring rain. Apparently, we got a winter's worth of rain in, in one hour. But we're so resilient that the very next morning we trained, the very next night it was flooding for a couple of days. We just kept lifting the mats up, like making it work. We ended up sparring on the concrete instead of on the mats and just did shark tank, but like in a, in a different way. Um, when that mat was too flooded, we went upstairs into a much, much smaller room, but we just, we just made it work and we got like a lot of hard training in over that period when a lot of other gyms would have been shut. And how much of the CKB team come across um, to help acclimatize and train and continue the train camp um, over and wherever you're fighting when you do fight? Yeah, well, there's uh, as many people as we could stuff, really. We got, I know um, Israel, Carlos, and Kaya here at the Engage pop-up store. Um, we've got Tyson and his supporters. Um, and I also, I feel like we have extended Fano from other gyms, like Justin Tuffer. He's like, basically part of the gym as well so we've got like a big big um team with us and i've also got my wrestling coach andre we got frank hickman they um helping out with loma so we're all like very very tight-knit group but it is more than just city kickboxing cool thank you thank you in your last or the last few early even in your early fights uh you used your interviews you said you want to spread suicide awareness prevention awareness especially with young men in your country so during this long layoff have you done anything else in the community uh that we that we're not aware of that maybe kind of helps spread the suicide awareness message um so i have like a mentor i guess in that realm um funny thing i'll, I'll share this story but in 2019 after i spoke on like um how our youth suicide rates were so high it was because i was going through my own stuff and i never felt anything like that before in my life i was pretty happy go lucky kid um but then i just thought man there's so many other kids that must be feeling worse because they don't have as like a good outlook for their future but i reached out to a guy called mike king who's one of the he used to be a comedian like a really famous comedian he owned part of k1 global owned his own airline like this dude was like the top top tier like dave Chappelle of new zealand he went through all his own stuff and he is leading the charge on um, helping to change the narrative around suicide and how we can get ahead of things and not just focus on like putting a band-aid over it but like trying to find a solution to the problem. But the story was that in 2019, I just was like, this is too hard um, taking on all this stuff and I wanted to stop fighting. That's what I told him. I was like, I think I want to take a big break from fighting and I want to stop. And he told me like, no, we need a champion just for if this stuff's too hard, just focus on being the best fighter that you can be, get to that world champion status. And it, from that, the kids will see from, you know, 2019 when he was depressed to 2025, 2026, he became a world champion. And so that's been my focus is just focusing on doing what I do best, which is fight. Awesome.
cool. Thank you very much, everybody.